Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. Together, we'll explore and enjoy content and conversations around mastering transitions. In our relations, our wellness, our careers, our families, and especially in our missions and visions. You are invited to learn and love and listen with me. Welcome to Practice You. Welcome back to the podcast. I have with me today a new teacher to me, someone who's younger than me, someone who makes me proud to be a student. Her name is Chloe Valdery. Am I saying your name correct? Yes, that's correct. Perfect. Chloe, I am really, truly honored to talk to you today. I feel like your brain and your heart are so intact and you are so poised to help not just white people, but all people understand what is important right now in terms of unity and empathy and compassion and clarity with our communications. You started the theory of enchantment Dot com, which is the course that I'm taking right now. I'm taking that course, and I'm also studying with April Dawn Harter, who is uh, Racism Recovery. And the two are so perfectly complementary to each other. Um, after spending a year at Bartley, as a Bartley Fellow uh, at the Wall Street Journal, HO, you developed the Theory of Enchantment, which is an innovative framework for social-emotional learning. This is something that I studied a few years ago, actually, and I'm obsessed <laughs> with uh, with the work, and I feel like it helped me be a better mom and a better teacher. This is also about character development. It's about interpersonal growth, and the course wonderfully uses pop culture as an educational tool. Um, you've trained around the world. You've been in South Africa training, the Netherlands, Germany, Israel. Your clients have included high school and college students, government agencies, business teams, You've lectured in universities across America, including Harvard and Georgetown. <laughs> I'm so, I love it. I'm an Ivy girl, so I really appreciate awesome. it. Um, your work's been covered in Psychology Today uh, magazine. Your writings have appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. Yay, you. I'm so happy to talk to you. The first thing that I want to point out to my listener is that you grew up in New Orleans, and you grew up in a very particular situation. You were learning Black empowerment as a matter of course from a very young age. Langston Hughes, Maya Angelou, these were the people to whom you were exposed as a child. And I would love to hear about maybe one or two of the most seminal teachers that you had at that time and how that shaped you and made you into this very uh, visionary teacher now. Sure. I would say, you know, I attended Langston Hughes Elementary School for about four years, uh, so kindergarten through third grade. And, you know, when I was six years old, uh, my memory is a bit of a blur because six years old was such a long time ago. But I do remember mostly the fact that so many of our homework assignments were to memorize poetry. Mm. And uh, specifically, you know, to memorize the poetry of Langston Hughes, which was the namesake of the school. Um, but also the poetry of others, such as Maya Angelou. The first poem I was first forced to memorize was a poem about Harriet Tubman, which went something like, Harriet Tubman didn't take no stuff, wasn't mm -hmm. scared of nothing either, didn't come in this world to be no slave, and didn't stay one either. 19 times she ran back south to get 300 others. 19 times she ran back south to save Black sisters and brothers. So that is the, the earliest uh, poem I remember having to memorize. And then, of wow. course, I was also uh, compelled to memorize Maya Angelou. And her poem, Still I Rise, was probably uh, the second poem I was forced to memorize, which, you know, started off by, you may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may tread me down in the very dirt, but still like dust I'll rise. And so I think at a very early age, there was something like resiliency that was constantly being, I guess you could say, inculcated into my development right. as, a, as a human being. Um, and it was in part certainly reflected in 
the poets whose works I, I had to memorize as a young child. If only all of us had had to memorize those works, yes. the world would look very different. Absolutely. I really believe that. There is uh, an interesting polarity uh, right now, obviously. it's We're in July of 2020. You're, we're seeing a whole crew of people who are seeing healing happening by steeping ourselves in the brutal history and continuing to reckon with the truth that many of us weren't told. And there's also this moment that we we have to actually equip people of color in the present time with a sense of worthiness and wholeness and presence and space. I'm also seeing that we have to do this for folks who are passing as white. Mm. And I think this is where your course comes in because you're in the theory of enchantment. You have to look at this if you're listening, theoryofenchantment.com. We're delineating those as two different projects, like learning as much as we can mm -hmm. and equipping everybody with a, with a sense of worthiness and wholeness, presence. Um, but we're kind of making the mistake of having a political conversation that's actually addressing a spiritual issue. Mm -hmm. The worthiness and wholeness and presence and space, this is something that all of us desperately need and it's not a political conversation. It's a spiritual conversation. It goes so much more beyond the current politics, which are just so obscenely ridiculous. You've even addressed in your, in your course quality of life as a spiritual matter, mm -hmm. noting that uh, community, family, faith, all of them are greater privileges than material wealth. I'm interested in hearing you talk about the three guiding principles of the theory of enchantment, I'm also, and I know my listener is interested in hearing you talk about the fact of granting people of any color, but particularly people of color, a sense of worthiness and, and wholeness right now through these three principles. Sure. So the three principles of the theory of enchantment are, number one, treat people like human beings, not political abstractions. Number two, criticize to uplift and empower, never to tear down and never to destroy. And number three, root everything you do in love and compassion. And as you said in the beginning, you know, these are principles that any and every human being, I think, can use to guide their spiritual inner life to develop a sense of character uh, and a sense of, uh, of a better and more healthier relationship with the human condition which is inevitably riddled with suffering. One of the things I said to a friend recently is that even if tomorrow we were to solve racism, if there were, was no more racism in society, there would still be human suffering in our society because life is suffering. This is what uh, some of the greatest uh, spiritual teachings of old have always taught us. And so, you know, the theory of enchantment is really meant to help people confront that suffering head on, develop tools for resiliency, and be able to successfully overcome by having a sense of inner contentment and a sense of wholeness with themselves, and take that sense of wholeness and then sort of communicate it to and apply it to the relationship with others. Theory of enchantment is based upon the notion that you cannot have a healthy relationship with others unless you first have a healthy relationship with yourself. Mm -hmm. And I would also add that the theory of enchantment you know, approaches this question of diversity and inclusion in an integrated way in the sense that it, it doesn't simply address the question of, you know, how, how many people of color should be on an executive team in a company. Um, I think theory of enchantment addresses the issue in a much more deep, deep way in the sense that it forces its students to actually grapple with the ideas and texts written by many prominent African-American writers, spiritual thinkers, who are also the forefathers and mothers of this American Republic right. and who taught us something about how to, how to properly critique the ills of society, racism and otherwise, mm -hmm. without losing one's sense of uh, sensuality, as Baldwin put it, yep. without, without losing one's soul, as it were, without losing an ability to, I think, be in touch with oneself and to delight, to delight in being alive simply for the sake of being alive. Um, and so that's what the theory of enchantment really aims to do. And the, I'm really proud of it. And especially, you know, the, the, the first principle is so important, um, especially now, 
uh, which, you yeah. know, as you said earlier about sort of the, the superficial and insufficient political frameworks that we're using to discuss these problems um, are really taking a toll, I think. And the, that's why the first principle is so important because the first principle really tries to teach people not only, you know, to treat one another like human beings, but in the expounding upon that in the coursework itself to teach people what it actually means to be a human being what it means to deal with insecurity, parental baggage, intergenerational baggage, mortality, how, the, how do you confront the fact of your mortality so that right. you do not lose yourself in the process. Right. Um, and so this is you know, universally applicable, but of course, um, as people of color are going through in this country, I'm having to engage in conversation with our white brothers and sisters who may not have known about, or no, may not have known to the same extent about the historical injustices that have happen in this country, mm. um, I think that these will be tools of, of resiliency and compassion that will help light, light and guide the way. There's no question. Um, the presence that you have infused into the course with modern references, music, <laughs> pop culture, incredibly effective. I have never seen anything yeah. like this course, never. The lesson in the, one of the first modules of holding two very disparate truths or realities in one space and not needing to agree was I was sold instantly. Um, because that's happened now in a, in a bunch of conversations actually with teachers of mine and friends of mine. And it's cool. We don't have to mm -hmm. agree. This yep. is what I feel. That's what you feel. Can we still host within our bodies empathy for each other? Mm -hmm. The observation that was made by one of the students after reading the excerpt from East of Eden, which I died over, I forgot all about it, <laughs> regarding empathy, people never know. This is an important, for my listener, an important point. People never know what you're going through or what baggage you may have or walk around with. And neither do you know the depth of the similar baggage, baggage that others may have. And he wrote this. This was something so important to read at this time. We have to remember, if you're listening to this, we have to remember, you just have no idea what people are going through. You don't know what their mother did to them or their father didn't do for them. You have no idea who was around when that person was 5, 10, 15, and how that's playing out for them right now and their interaction with you. So just one of the main teachings of this course thus far, for me, I'm, I'm more than halfway through, is empathy. Can you just remember that everyone has as much, if not more baggage as you do? And can you just soften yourself a little bit? Be aware that the possibility that others might have that can help us begin to understand when their behavior is seemingly irrational, incomprehensible. I can't thank you enough for that. In that same module, in the end of uh, Halevi's book, how he mm -hmm. lets go of the animosity that he had toward non-Jews, and he chooses inclusion over extremism. Today, you point out that he works as an educator in Israel, brings Muslims and Jews together. In the book, his father's trauma was real and powerful, but instead of transferring that trauma through him onto others, he transformed it into empathy. And it's the same teaching in East of Eden, you point out, Timshel, which is a Hebrew phrase, T-I-M-S-H-E-L, transliterated, which means thou mayest. Mm -hmm. I remember this in Hebrew school. As a Jewish girl, <laughs> I'm a Jewish girl from Long Island, and I was raised on Hebrew school, and I know that you have Jewish heritage. Is this true? Well, it, it depends on who you ask. So... <laughs> So my father, my, my grandfather on my father's side was a huge fan of the Jewish community. Hmm. Um, he, he named his, he gave his sons uh, Jewish middle names. So my wow. father's middle name is Jacob wow. um, uh, to honor the Jewish community. And it has been said, and this may be apocryphal, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. It has been said that my grandfather at some point actually converted to Judaism I, wow. I can neither confirm nor deny that. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so it's possible that I have some Jewish Jewish heritage, but certainly on a deeper existential and philosophical level, my many of my teachers have been Jewish. Mm -hmm. uh, many of many of those who have who have taught me a philosophy that I cling to and that has informed my view of the world has certainly uh, derived from Jewish spiritual texts. So 
I am, I am certainly in deep relationship with that community and with that philosophical tradition. So let's talk about thou mayest, because implicit in that term is the idea that while, as you say in the course, while human beings often have baggage that's passed down to them from their parents, mm -hmm. we still have the power to choose and craft our own destinies, beliefs, and choices, regardless of our situation. We always have the power to choose. Read Viktor Frankl's book again, mm -hmm. and you'll see that again. That's what distinguishes us as beings on the planet from, you know, an animal. How important is it for you? I mean, I think it's, I know the answer, obviously it's the most important thing, but how important is it for you to make sure that that one concept gets across? Thou mayest, you, thou mayest choose exactly what you feel or think. I think this is a healer. This one mm -hmm. concept is a healer for all of us. The real question is, how does this lead you toward what follows in the course, which is stoicism? And I've never seen it taught so clearly. Um, <laughs> tell me about how that came to pass in your own life and your own understanding, and then we'll talk about how it appears in the course. Sure. So it's interesting. I, I read East of Eden later on in life, and, and I mean that by just the fact that a lot of people who I know who have read East of Eden told me that they read it in high school. I read it with a friend, actually, who I worked with uh, at the Wall Street Journal. Shout out to Jessica Casimir Jacobs. Um, and we read it together, uh, even though we weren't in the same environment when we read it together. And we sort of kept each other aware of like where we were. Uh, I read East of Eden in, I think, 10 days. That's how much of a page turner it was for me. Yeah. Um, and it really was so eye-opening and it clarified so many things for me at the time. And Tim Shell was, was such a huge, I guess you could call it a discovery because obviously it, 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 it is a healer to, to reiterate what you said, because it imbues people with a sense of choice, with a sense of autonomy, with a sense of agency. It imbues people with so much power, right? It empowers you to, to know that despite the parental baggage you may have, and of course, East of Eden is very much about parental baggage and the, right. the trauma that's passed down in this particular case from fathers to sons. But despite how much parental baggage one carries and despite the weight of suffering one carries, one always has the ability to choose. Right. Um, and there's a particular, there's a particular uh, saying that's made later on in the in the book where one of the sort of wise figures uh lee tells one of the characters he says and now that you know that you don't have to be perfect you can be good mm. and that that really is sort of uh, i think contained in this idea of of, of tim show or tim show which ultimately comes from um the biblical teaching of cain and abel after mm -hmm. cain is cursed uh he is told by god that thou mayest um which in the book East of Eden is explained in, in a way to mean you may choose to do evil, but you may also choose to do good. Right. And you, al you always have a choice. No matter how hard it, it may seem, you always have a choice. And I think that people just being told that they have a choice, being reminded that they have a choice is so important in today's mm -hmm. day and age. And another reason why that was such an aha moment for me was because, you know, I had fallen in love with Mumford and Sons in high school, mm. uh, British band, uh, that some of you may have heard of. Yes. And, you know, I had fallen in love with them in high school and they had made a song called Tim Show when I was, maybe this was uh, 2009. And, you know, I had no idea that they were actually alluding to East of Eden in, the, in that song. And so to just rediscover that content in a different context and in its origin story was really special to me. And the way that that naturally and organically led to Stoicism I think was my realization that, you know, if, if you understand that you may choose, then to what extent are the emotional experiences that one goes through uh, able to be regulated? And I think that that's what stoicism is ultimately all about, uh, imbuing people with the sense that perception is reality. And one can, one will inevitably experience the full range of emotions, right? But one can control those emotions and not allow those emotions to control them. Um, mm. I, you know, I somehow discovered or decided to study uh, Stoicism when I think I was scrolling through my Instagram at some point and saw that Charlemagne, uh, the famous radio host, had posted something about Ryan Holiday because uh, Charlemagne also studies Stoicism. He's, he sometimes posts about Stoicism 
on his Instagram. And so he had talked about Ryan Holiday. And I decided to buy a book called Everyday Stoicism by Ryan Holiday. And that's how I got into it. But it seemed to me that, you know, the writings and the teachings of Marcus Aurelius paralleled the writings and the teachings in East of Eden and paralleled the writings and teachings in uh, certain Disney films. And so I kept noticing these patterns that kept repeating themselves. But that's how the I, the idea of uh, of Thalmaeus or Tim Shell sort of naturally flowed into Stoicism for me. Yeah. And when in the course you talk about the Greek Stoic Ep- Epictetus, mm-hmm. who once said, quote, the chief task in life is simply this, to identify and separate matters so that I can say clearly to myself which are externals, not under my control, and which have to do with the choices I actually control. Where then do I look for gra- for good and evil? Not to uncontrollable externals, but within myself, to the choices that are my own. And upon reading this, I realized it parallels the fourth way. I don't mm. know if you've ever studied it, but it parallels the fourth way a lot because in the fourth way teachings, you learn that there's this sense of divided attention. I have part of my attention on what's happening around me, the whatever conflict, chaos, you know, anything that's happening externally, most of which I am unable to control. And I also have part of my attention on what's happening within me. And it's exactly the same concept, the primary teaching. We can't control and rely on external events. We can only control ourselves and our responses. So I appreciated that because I think right now more than ever, this is, um, it's critical. It's critical for all of us. It doesn't matter what, you know, if, you, if you've taken a side, it doesn't matter what side you're on. Mm-hmm. You have to take yourself on, as you said first. Um, one of the things that I learned was from this course also the stoicism training for the civil rights citizens in the 50s and the 60s in Texas and Virginia and North Carolina. This was critical to my education on the history and experience of people of color in this country, particularly black people. The quote goes like this. The key to the sit-in is nonviolence. It takes a tough inner fiber neither to flinch nor retaliate when, occasionally, hooligans pick on the sitters in to discourage them or provoke them into some violent act. Fearing the stress on sensibilities and temper to which a sit-in could be subjected, the high school and college students of Petersburg, Virginia, studied at a unique but punishing extracurricular school before they attempted sitting in. In the course, which they ironically call social drama, students are subjected to a full repertory of humiliation and minor abuse. Can you imagine? To train for this. These include smoke blowing in your face, hair pulling, chair jostling, coffee spilling, hitting with wadded newspaper, along with such epithets as things that I will not repeat. Anyone who gets mad flunks the course. Now, I ask you, listener, listening, can you imagine that in the 50s and the 60s, people had to train to be harassed while they were sitting in peaceably for a cause in which they believed for a cause that represented unification, truth, and equality. I'll ask you to cut to the present day. I was just talking to a friend of mine who's up in Pennsylvania temporarily, and she said she went to a protest, peaceful, people sitting, and around the rim of the square where the protest was occurring, pickup trucks, Confederate flags, and visible firearms circling like dogs the sitters in. This is no different than the 50s and the 60s. No different. And never before has your work been more important. Yes, it's very um, apropos, I think, that we're speaking about this just days after the passing of John Lewis, who was, of course, involved in these kinds of protests and um, sit-ins as the chair of SNCC at the time. Mm. Um, But it's important to recall that the reason that stoicism was used as a as a tool and a tactic to commit oneself to nonviolence was because of the teachings of uh, Dr. King and other pastors like him who promoted this idea of agape love which mm-hmm. is of course part of Christian philosophy right. um, which is love for its own sake love for one's fellow human being 
because that human being was made in the image of God. And this is true for the person who is protesting with you. It is true for the racist who hates you. It is true for the neutral bystander. And in this sense, it is a it is an incredibly radical idea. And we are actually uh, continuing to see, uh, even today, how radical this idea is. And one of the things that strikes me as curious is the fact that even though we celebrate MLK Day in this country, mm. I don't think, you know, and I include both Black and white Americans um, and Americans of every background in this statement, I don't think that the majority of us have spent enough time actually engaging with the ideas of Dr. King, really trying to internalize uh, the ideas of Christian agape love, which is a very difficult idea, not only in theory, but also in practice, to say to someone who is harassing you, who hates you I because love of you. your skin color, I love you. The, I love the you. amount of the amount of moral fiber, the amount of strength mm. that is required, the the level of character, the level of internal contentment, right, with oneself that is required to say that to someone who hates you is almost unimaginable. And yet an entire movement of the 60s and 50s was built upon that. And so I think it's worth reminding the listener of that and reminding and encouraging the listener to do more research into that, to study that, and to perhaps um, try to live one's life by that philosophy. My life has been uh, significantly enhanced by thinking about this for the last several days, weeks. And when we go into the principle number six, practicing misfortune. This Mm -hmm. ties into what you've just said, so I wanna stay with it. When I look at Donald Trump on a screen, Mm -hmm. when I read about him in the Times, who hilariously calls him Mr. and not President, or any other (laughs) publication for that matter, they refuse to call him President, by the way, it's really funny. Mm -hmm. Um, But I can look at him now, and this is what this has taught me, this course, I can never thank you enough. I look at him and I see a child being mentally abused. Mm. This is the only way that he could come through in this way as an adult at this time in our history. So reckless. There must be so much fear Mm. and so much damage. And so I can look at that person, that face, the, 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 the obscene untruths that emerge from his mouth, and I can see the boy. And I can love that boy. Yeah, that's powerful. That sounds crazy, I realize, to some of you who are listening. But I promise you, it has freed me up inside. That's pretty powerful. It's it's um, it's very satisfying to me. Perhaps that's not the right word, but it's very satisfying to me I to hear it. you say. I get it. That you can see the fear. Yep. Because because I think that once you can, once you recognize that certain people are coming from a place of fear, Mm. it totally changes the lens through which you see them. That's right. Um, And it, at least for me, it, I am less inclined to, to descend to my baser self and hate a person when, once I recognize that the aggression that they are putting out into the world is coming from a place of fear. Even in his grimace, his ridiculous grimace, the color of his hair, the color of his skin, (laughs) All of it is a mask. Yeah, it's a facade. All of it. Yeah. Principle number six uh, in the six practices, rather, of Stoicism. Ryan Holiday writes about this in that book, The 365 Days, which I think is a great book for everybody to have, honestly, at this time in history. Quote, emotions like anxiety and fear have their roots in uncertainty, rarely in experience. Anyone who has made a big bet on themselves... (laughs) <laughs> knows how much energy both of these states, anxiety and fear, can consume. The solution is to do something about that ignorance. Make yourself familiar with the things, the worst case scenarios of which you're afraid. Practice what you fear. Whether a simulation in your mind or in real life, the downside is almost always reversible or transient. It's almost always going to pass. I mean, it will always pass. We all die. It will always pass. We die. We die. We're all going to die. I love talking about death too, but that's another podcast. (laughs) When, When we make ourselves familiar with what scares us, I think this is what's important. And even in me looking at Fox News, Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
because that scares me. It scares yeah. the level of of ignorance and arrogance. It actually does bring me fear. But the more I watch it, if I look at it and make myself familiar with the storylines and the ways of seeing, the ways of thinking, I get less afraid and I get more committed. And I think there's something very, very valuable to this sixth practice of stoicism. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you for that too. Well, I think it's connected to one of the themes of stoicism, which is meditate on your mortality. Um, right. And, you know, the, the practice of the teaching rather of practicing your misfortune ultimately is connected to this idea of meditating on, on your mortality. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is why this is presented under the umbrella of the first principle of the theory of enchantment to be a human being requires or to be alive, to be fully alive, requires that you confront the most important facts of your life, which includes the fact of your mortality. Mm -hmm. um, and I think from there, one can actually train themselves to be able to bear anything once one makes peace with the fact of their mortality. Right. Um, and so that, that sixth idea, I think, flows naturally from that, from that idea of meditating on your mortality. Which then flows into your very deft comparison of criticism and care. When we move into the principle of theory of enchantment, which says, criticize to uplift and empower never to tear down or to destroy. Criticism is defined as the expression of disapproval of someone or something based on, this is important, perceived faults or mistakes. Mm -hmm. Perceived is critical. Care is defined as serious attention or consideration applied to doing something correctly or to avoid damage. Okay. If somehow, I just feel like you're an old lady. You're like 85 <laughs> years old in there. If somehow we can combine criticism and care together, I've been applying this, get this, in my relationship with my man. Mm-hmm to as soon as I see something that is a perceived mistake of, of his note, mm -hmm. I'm emphasizing perceived, I instantly go to, okay, how can I give serious attention or consideration to avoid damage as I ask for something different? It has completely transformed the way that we relate to each other. Wow. Yeah, completely. It's unbelievable. And so the listener, can you please look up the definitions of criticism and care, write them down in your own hand, in your, in your journal or somewhere, put them up on your wall. If you have kids, if you have a partner, if you have a, a roommate, if you have a parent, anyone who's around in your space, a sibling and commit your household to practicing the two in tandem. One is not allowed to be without the other. And you will start to see that even when you want to care about somebody, but you can look and see what are the perceptions I'm pouring into this care, you might even refine the way you care about people, which has been happening to me. It's so powerful to think about this. And then, of course, you you have us watch the Tupac and Maya Angelou story, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. Let's summarize it for the listener. I'll start and you can finish me off. So Tupac and Maya Angelou were on a movie set. They are both working together. Tupac is, you know, peacock feathers up. And <laughs> yes. as he as he is, I'm such a huge fan of every... <laughs> I cried when he died. I cried when Biggie died. I just... You can't even imagine I'm such a hip-hop girl. And <laughs> they're on a set together. Maya Angelou is seeing him treat someone on the set with with no care whatsoever. Is this true? Yes. She yes. then proceeds to call him over. And I'll let you finish the story because it's so beautiful how you tell it. Yeah, so she calls him over and she says, let me talk to you, let me talk to you. And he's still sort of mumbling under his breath with, with epithets uh, toward this guy that he's about to get into a physical altercation with. And she says again, come over here, let me talk to you, let me talk to you. And finally he comes over and she tells him, don't you know that my generation has been waiting for your generation to come along, pleading mm -hmm. for your generation, praying for your generation, hoping for your generation. And it is our hope that we have placed upon your shoulders. 
uh, and we desire for you to live up to the legacy and to live up to the promise that we started to build, but that we are waiting for your generation to fulfill. And she starts to criticize his behavior in a manner that indicates that she believed in him, that she mm. believes in his potential, that she believes in the promise of both him in particular and his generation at large. And the story goes that in the very next moment, Tupac actually started crying Oof. because no one had ever criticized him in a way that indicated their actual belief in his potential and their belief in his future. And so the next day when they were both on set, it's not as if he had made amends with this guy that he was about to fight. But he, he as soon as uh, he saw Maya Angelou walking in the hallway, he straightened himself up and he made sure to comport himself and present himself in a way that was appropriate and that was that she would have looked upon with admiration. And he said to her, good morning, Miss Angelou. Um, and his behavior literally changed in the face of someone or in the presence of someone who told him explicitly that they believed in him. And there's a universally applicable lesson here that a person will not develop character and cannot develop character unless they are valued. And this may seem counterintuitive because if you're dealing with someone, you know, again, who is acting irresponsibly toward you or behaving in a manner that you approve, disapprove of, it may be very easy for you to impulsively respond to that person by denigrating that person, by telling that person that they will never be mm -hmm. anything, um, by telling that person they're, that they're trash, so to speak. But that person, if you want that person to develop character, you actually have to value them. You actually have to care about that person. You have to believe in that person's potential and invest in that person's potential and speak to them in a manner that suggests that you believe in them. And in this particular module in the course, you ask in the relating to the text section, you actually ask when you criticize others, how can you do so following Dr. Angelou's method? Mm -hmm. How can you, you know, what tips can you practice is the next question to remind yourself that when you criticize others, you should do so with their well-being in mind. Mm -hmm. What a different world it would be. And how would you want somebody to criticize you? What a beautiful consideration, listener. How would you want somebody who with whom you disagreed to criticize you in order to uplift and empower you? Think of the words that you would want them to use. And then do not diverge from those words. Such a beautiful teaching, such a, such a mature teaching. The last section that I wanted to talk about the course is you go into... Uh, the Lion King. I'm <laughs> yes. so happy. We love this. My kid is 14 now. We watched it over and over. We even went to see the play in New York. But Simba learns to practice stoicism in that transformational moment that we all know of. He confronts the spirit of his father. He confronts the the nature of his own mortality. He focuses on what he can control, foregoes obsessing over what he cannot control, which is the, obviously the past. And he learns to take that sort of satellite view that I, mm -hmm. I always think about when, particularly when my kid is, you know, being in some way unpleasant or uncaring. I just go way up into the satellite. And I recall being 14 and how it felt to be with my parents for any length of time, much less all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, the lyrics to this song, you point out really deftly that there is the heart, the head, the heart and the feet. Head says, what's something that you've learned so far in this curriculum that made you think? And I love this, this consideration at the end of, the, of, the, of this particular section, the heart question. What's something that you learned so far that made you feel? And when you look at Simba, you can feel the transformation happen. You can feel the moment where, you know, the listener, you can think about this in your own life, that dreadful, sad also exhilarating moment when you realize your parent is not a superhero and you're both, I'm going to curse, you're both completely fucked and completely, <laughs> and completely free. Yes. And then your feet. What's something you learned so far in this curriculum that you'll actually take with you? These are all such good questions. And what I've taken with me, I can't even put into words, uh, but I have basically over the course of this entire talk, so many practical cues that I'm using, not just in my own recovery from racism, 
but in my relations with my family, in my relations with people that seem to be in conflict with me, but in fact, nobody's really in conflict with me. They're just having their own experience. Mm -hmm. So I'm really grateful. I'm so happy to hear that you've uh, taken so much so far from, from this course. You know, it was very, really a joy for me to put it together. Um, and also the fact that I ended the teaching of the first principle as applied to the self with the Lion King was such a, <laughs> was such a fun thing for me to do. It's beautiful. It's really well done. Really well done. Third module in the theory course, last couple things. Consider the following observation that James Baldwin made about the villain, quote unquote, in the Jim Crow South in 65. Quote, now I suggest that all the terrible things that can happen to a human being, that's one of the worst. I suggest that what has happened to white Southerners is in some ways, after all, much worse. This is so interesting than what has happened to Negroes because what's happened to Negroes there because Sheriff Clark in Selma, Alabama cannot be dismissed as a total monster. I'm sure he loves his wife, his children. I'm sure you know he likes to get drunk. You know, after all, one's got to assume he's visibly a man like me, but he doesn't know what drives him to use the club. This is so crucial. This is where John Lewis, rest in peace. I feel like this is where he lived in this space right here. He doesn't know what drives him to use the club, this sheriff who beats people, to menace with the gun, to use the cattle prod. Something awful must have happened to a human being to be able to put a cattle prod against a woman's breasts, for example. What happens to the woman is ghastly, he says. What happens to the man who does it is in some ways much, much worse. What a revelation. Wow. Wow. It, it brings into very sharp relief everything that we're looking at right now. It doesn't make me want to be passive. It doesn't make me want to step away and just wait for the fuckers to get theirs. <laughs> you know what I mean? Quote, unquote. It makes me want to continue committing myself to seeing the sad beneath this anger mm -hmm. and the abuse that these guys driving pickup trucks with with visible firearms around a peaceful protest must have endured mm. it's it's so irreparable the damage that was done to a child who becomes an adult who can do that mm -hmm. yet hopefully maybe it's not i think this begs the question and i've thought about this certainly as you know, COVID nineteen hits and social unrest right. uh, descended upon our our nation. There's so much pain everywhere. There's so much pain, yeah. um, and so the question is, how do we how do we get to the point in the, our society where we even first we have to realize that there's so much healing that needs to unfold. The amount of emotional energy it takes to even just to come to that realization, let alone to start the healing, but to come to the realization that what is needed is in fact healing, I think is such a task. I agree. At the end of the course, towards the end, you talk about practice and there are three ways to practice. And I, I want to leave my listener with this. And then I have three simple, short questions to ask you, which I ask of almost every guest, but these three ways to practice really bring us to a clear purpose and a way forward. The first is practical. And there are three questions that, that I'll repeat with this. I'm not going to give it all away, of course. But in any moment of conflict, think to yourself, write this down, listener, because this is important. It's useful. Get a pen, go get a piece of paper. In any moment of conflict, think to yourself, how am I and this person alike? How am I like Donald Trump? I have a child. I have a need for attention. <laughs> <laughs> I have a desire to lead. I have a desire to do what I feel is good in the world. Right? I could go on. There's a lot mm -hmm. that we have in common, actually. Two, what values may we both have or share? Third question, what feelings of fear and insecurity might both of us have experienced? 
Okay? These are crucial questions. You will never find yourself in those spaces of like, I can't do anything about this. I can't even look at it anymore. It's so awful. <laughs> it's like, no, we're all here. We're, we're here and he's here and it's happening. So how do you, how do you practice looking at it? The second way is probing. And I'm not giving all of the pieces of this one because I think it's important for folks to take the course, but writing new goals related to empathy and understanding the self you want to practice in your daily life. What are some of those goals for that person? that relate to the empathy and the understanding that you want to practice. How are you going to show up for your kid? How are you going to show up differently for your sibling? A lot more empathy. How are you mm -hmm. going to show up for your parent who's sick and fucking annoying or something? You know, who, <laughs> who knows? I'm just, I'm making, I'm trying to make light of it, but who knows, you know? Yeah. And then in a personal way, lastly, asking yourself if you ever find that other people's stories or experiences, it's the same question really in a different way, mirror your own. And when that was unexpected, those are the moments that you really want to focus on in your exploration because guess what? I didn't expect myself to even remotely find a familiarity or a similarity to Donald Trump, but I'm sure there are, there are many. I know there are many. I've already identified them. I've done the writing on it. And the fact is, I can never look at him the same way again. I can still have utter disdain for the way he's handling things. And oh my God, the carelessness, <laughs> millions of people, a hundred, whatever, 140,000 people by this time are dead. Many tens of thousands of them are avoidable because this guy refused to wear a mask. That's without question would have helped you can give me all the science you got on how germs can get through a mask. I'm telling you right now, <laughs> cover your face. <laughs> like, even in light of all of that, I still can see where the two of us can coincide. And it helps me have peace in my body. Um, anything that you would like to share with regards to a moment of empathy that you experienced where you felt connected to someone different from you and it changed you? I think that I'm very active on Twitter. <laughs> you are. And as I was developing the theory of enchantment coursework, um, some of these things I try to practice and implement. And one of the ways in which that manifested itself was by pausing before sending off a tweet that may have been, or that would have been, very much um, ill-advised, that would have been too harsh, that would have lacked compassion, that where I wouldn't have practiced seeing myself um, and the person sort of on the other side of the screen as having a commonality. I found myself pausing and trying to practice some of those things, some of those teachings. And of course, I fail sometimes. I'm human after all. But mm. I, I certainly, I think, in implementing some of the things that you just mentioned, was able to reword some of the tweets that I sent out in a way that tried to center the humanity of the person I was disagreeing with, even right. as I disagreed with them. And I noticed that the response was very different. The response to, you know, the newly reframed tweet was very much, much less aggressive and mm -hmm. much more of an attempt to see where the two of us were coming from and to create space for that empathy and to create space for that compassion. Yeah. Um, so in, in transforming my perception of the other person on the, side, on the other side of the screen, the, the outcome was also transformed in the process. I can imagine. The, um, the Twitter handle that you have is C Valdery, V-A-L-D-A-R-Y for the listener, if you want to go check it out. Uh, her work is at Enchant Theory. E N C H A N T T H E R O T H E O R Y. Um, the it's funny you wrote an article in 2017. Your first piece in the New York Times. The title of that article it's an opinion piece. Why I refuse to avoid white people. <laughs> how, how you're so old. <laughs> you're my old lady friend. <laughs> how old are you now, though? I'm actually turning 27 tomorrow. So, <laughs> oh, happy birthday, woman! Thank you. What a special moment! 
but you're you're 85 already <laughs> i'm convinced some um, some have said this to me so i'm not surprised to hear you say it. <laughs> it's so true the three questions i ask every guest are simple and fun and, and meant to be as light or as deep as you wish so you get to ask uh, you know answer them as you wish uh the first is what in your space personally or in your personal sphere needs to be uh healed right now oh that's such a, that's a you're, you're you're with the heavy hitters i know sorry <laughs> no that's okay. but you could take it light you could take it light and just go to what what's really at hand you know, it needs to be healed. Yes. So I think that, um, you know, my Angelo has this quote where she says, love liberates. Mm. And I think I'm still trying to fully internalize that. Yeah. In, in all of my relationships, including my non platonic ones. <laughs> I'll, yeah. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Please stay with that. Yeah. Stay with that through your thirties and your forties. It's going to be helpful. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> Yeah. The second question is, what's your favorite view? And some people go to, you know, I had uh, young Pueblo Diego on here and he was like, you know, from deep inside in his meditation, he began to expound. It was profound. And some people go to, you know, a view of a beautiful place that they visited. What's your favorite mm -hmm. view? Huh. What if I have two equally favorite ones? Absolutely free to do it. Okay. So one is... I meditate for an hour every day, and once the the noise goes off after the sixty minutes are up, mm -hmm. and I open my eyes because I usually try to do it in nature, and I open my eyes and I'm surrounded by the greenery of nature. Mm -hmm. That's one of my favorite views. Um, Post sitting, wow. Yeah, yeah, it's it's like high resolution, and if you keep doing it every day everything becomes a higher resolution. You see everything with higher resolution, yeah. um, which is which is quite beautiful. And my other favorite view is a view that I've only seen once, but it would have to be when I was in Rome in 2016, and I saw the sculptures of Bernini for the first time. Oh, dude. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's actually uh, in part where I because I was working on theory of enchantment, like the, I was working on a thesis paper that was still at the journal. And when I saw Bernini, one of Bernini's sculptures for the first time, an aha moment came to me about the theory of enchantment. So that will always be a memory that I have that's that's meaningful to me. I get that. The, the, the layers of that work, I can't even. Yeah. Third question. What does prayer mean to you? Ooh. Hmm. Oh, you're just, you're really good at this. <laughs> <laughs> I just love asking the good questions. We get, you know, we go places. Um, it's interesting. There's a quote from one of my favorite movies, Dangerous Beauty, uh, which chronicles the life and times of Veronica Franco, the famous courtesan of Venice. Um, Dude, I got to watch that now. Oh, it's so good. Uh, during I'm the watching it tonight. Yeah, it's so good. good. It's a cult classic. Uh where she goes, she's being questioned by the Spanish Inquisition, and she says something like, I confess that I chose passion over prayer. Such passion is prayer. And so every time I think about this question that you pose, what does prayer mean to me? I mean, that quote immediately rose up yeah. um, out of the depths. I find that to be, to be true for me in my life. Uh, and I try to live a pretty passionate life. And mm. I find that creating art in the form of especially music and meditation, you know, when I, when I sit and meditate, both of those are, are moments of prayer for me. So. Yeah. You just inspired me to lengthen my meditation too, which I'm excited about. Thank you for that. Awesome. Yep. Yep. It's a true story. Chloe, I am once again, impressed, grateful, and thrilled to watch you grow up. I can't even begin to thank you enough for myself, for my listener, and for anyone else who's touched by your work. It's of great value, and I really, truly appreciate it. Thank you for being here. Of course. Thank you for having me.